Ben, thank you for joining me on the Guild of Dads podcast today, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you on here. And you are in the unique position of having had a new arrival shortly before lockdown occurred. So uh, congratulations on, on your new arrival in the last few months. Thank you. Yeah, uh, what's her name? Ivy Ray Coomba. Now, I think about 14 weeks. So we had her and then it was like lockdown started. So yeah, first couple of weeks were like, oh, this is fine. We're at home anyway. We've got a new baby. And then it sort of did get quite weird. Yeah. Um, but little bundle of joy. Amazing. Uh, been through many ups and downs uh, the last couple of weeks with um i think more than anything emotionally adjusting to being a dad mm-hmm. more than it, not functionally like i'm not worried about and i kind of anticipated all the functional things like your routine will be mixed up lack of sleep like all that shit's obvious but i don't think anyone can really tell you how you're going to feel emotionally yeah. knowing that a small human now relies on you and you have to like check through literally every part of your life before you think like, can I do that? Should I do that? Are we doing this? What's the timing? Does it work? No, can't say yes to dinner. Right. Um, so I think more than anything, it was it was that that kind of tripped me up a little bit. But mm. I, I ain't been too bad. Yeah, yeah. And what have you found the most sort of challenging things in those last in those first sort of few weeks of, of being a dad? Because I'm 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 a bit more of a veteran. Mine are like eight and eight and eleven now, so I can look back with those times with glee. <laughs> two things one is like planning so i'm self-employed and while i while my work is quite flexible i have to be around a certain amount for like my team meetings all that kind of stuff and um unfortunately during lockdown we had quite a few health challenges with family had you know family member die from covid uh so like funeral then other people went into hospital so like all of these things on top of everything else just made it quite like, damn. I'd, and even if I planned to like work four hours that day, like that time just sort of evaporated. So I was constantly like, you know, damn. Um, and just sort of juggling that, oh, I should be there. I should be doing this for that people, like my team. And so that was the other thing. And then the second thing was having a form of meditation, mm-hmm. um, not strict meditation but something that took your mind off being a dad for half an hour Mm -hmm. um you know we can talk about like reading a book Mm, doesn't really immerse your mind um i've always been a big fan of sport and you can't play sport thinking about other things like you have to play sport or that's it otherwise you get basically beaten up or whatever so i used to play rugby and i got to like eight weeks into lockdown and i was like i just need a mental break even for half an hour i just need my mind to go off onto something else so they're probably the two things that i struggled with the most Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and have you found that the meditation has kind of been helping do you were you meditating before or is it something you've taken up since 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 um, since your daughter was born so what i mean by that is meditation in terms of you don't have the mind wandering so i've been an active meditator of the past but i find that I've got quite a relaxed, meditative, reflective mind now. It's like anything. If you practice something for a while, it becomes a bit of an innate skill. Mm. So um, I'll quite often go for a walk with my daughter in the morning and I'll just go and in silence, like sometimes she'll sleep, sometimes she won't, like whatever. Um, And I'll just be present with my thoughts. So I don't actively like, right, I'm going to sit down and do 10 minutes meditation Mm. because that doesn't take your mind off something fully. Mm -hmm. It still allows your mind to wander and explore um but i'm a very reflective person i like um sort of understanding myself and improving myself i don't think you can be the best version of yourself without doing that without Mm -hmm. spending time with your thoughts i don't think i would ever be an amazing dad if i didn't spend time working at myself um what i think should be good parenting my habits like you know, I'm already reading parenting books on like the behavioral components of the the father child relationship and stuff, because I want to get it right. I wouldn't yeah. say I've, you know, I'd say there's things I would want to change from the parenting relationships I've been exposed to. Mm-hmm. So I don't want those to influence how I behave as a parent. Yeah. Um, and I, I you know, I'm, I've got full faith in myself of doing a good job, but I want to really understand it. But 
now I'm reading the books and immersing myself in it. It's absolutely fascinating. Mm. It's just fascinating how much we impact our children. Like mm. people talk about it. They're like, oh, you know, your kids know everything. They watch you, they do this. But people still don't really seem to change their behavior much. Like sometimes I'm around parenting and I'm like, oh, like, wow, are you aware of what you just did in front of your child? Like, and the thing is, is so many people's habits are completely innate and then don't have full awareness over those habits that your child picks up on all that stuff. And then, mm. you know, their child gets to like a difficult age. And I'm not going to say what a difficult age is because I don't have older you know, kids yet, but they reach a difficult age and it's like, oh, I wonder where they got that from or oh, why are they doing this? Why are they acting up? Why are they behaving in this way? And I'm like, there's not really many places to point apart from parenting. Mm. Like they might have got into the wrong friends group. They might have had a bad teacher at school. They might have started watching a bad program on Netflix and maybe it's influenced them in some way. Chances are a lot of that stem from parenting. So mm. I am just absolutely fascinated by it. I just yeah. think it's an incredible topic. Yeah. You'd, you'd really dig the uh, last episode that I did with uh, uh, an American... Um, psychologist called Ed Tronic and also uh, a lady called who's a paediatrician called uh, Claudia Gold and we delved into this very uh, subject uh, it's called the power of discord they've written a book about it uh, and they delve into this still face experiment I don't know whether you've come across that in your reading which is where um, for a long time they believed that the interactions interactions between a parent and child were kind of one way um, so they did this still face experiment where the, the mother is kind of interacting with her child and then kind of deliberately makes their face go completely like um, emotionless and you watch the, the the baby get kind of progressively more agitated and stuff as they're trying to get the mum's attention and stuff and that and then it progresses to the point where the baby's getting really kind of quite upset um, and then mum stops doing the still face and things kind of go back to normal and they talk about this concepts of called it's called mismatch and repair so through relationships you know sometimes there'll be some kind of discord or s some um kind of uh, disagreement or whatever but through kind of the repair process that's how we begin to find meaning through relationships and interactions with kind of one another but it's something we delve into on on, on this podcast quite a bit and something i've experienced where where quite often our point of reference as to how we behave is our own parents so mm -hmm. but the problem is is you it's not until you, like you say as a parent you start to do this you start to um find yourself thinking well my dad used to say that or my mum used to say that to me and then you think actually that wasn't too great and it's kind of you know it's being a, it's having that awareness to say okay um I recognize that this is a learned behavior of mine. How can I break that chain? Because effectively you've got an ongoing chain between your kind of your grandparents, then to your parents, then to you. How can you kind of break that chain and reset some of those aspects of it? Not in a way to say, oh, my parents were terrible and they whatever, but how, how can you kind of tweak elements of that? You know what I mean? Going forward. Mm, I love that. Um, Lizzie, was holding Ivy a couple of weeks ago and uh, she burst into tears and literally within about six seconds, Ivy just burst into tears as well, literally mirrored her emotion straight away. And uh, one of the things I'm trying to be very aware of now, you know, being self-employed, being, you know, being a business owner that has their business online, like I'm literally 95% online is that when I'm with Ivy, can I 100% be a dad? Like I'm not floating in between work and I know we're all sort of aware of this, but you know, even these interactions with the phone, like if I'm around my phone, if I hold my phone, if I'm taking a photo, Ivy just stares at it. Mm. She's like, she's fascinated by it, but then it's constantly breaking my interaction with her. It's breaking the emotional connection all the time. This thing's getting in between mm. until someone becomes fully aware of what a mobile phone is and the purpose of that phone in someone's life, child has no idea what that phone is. Like, why is this object breaking the relationship and the connection between me and my dad? Mm. And that must be like really tough as a child. And one of the biggest um, lessons I learned from a book, um, amazing book, uh, the book you wish your parents had read. Yeah, the orange book, yeah. Yeah, the orange book, really good book. And one of the take homes from that is she just said, look, 
whenever you're like confused or frustrated or anxious or whatever, just stand back and like jump into your child's body. Like, try and understand where they're at. Like they've just come out of this sack of fluid. Like they don't really know what's going on. They're nosy. They're explorative. They cry because they're hungry. They cry because they've got wind. Like, And every interaction, if you're unsure, just like jump into their body. And it just really kind of takes you back and go, actually, I get why my baby is upset because she literally has no idea where she is, no idea what's going on, no idea what she's meant to feel, no idea why she's wearing what she's wearing. Like, their awareness is so small because yeah. they don't have the the understanding of words, culture, society yet. So, um, yeah, I'm going off on a ramble. It's just, it's totally blowing my mind at the moment. Like yeah. the power you have as a parent to sculpt, you know, the course of yeah. someone so small yet someone yeah. so amazing, so much yeah. potential. And there's a really good, I think it's in Brenda, Brenda Bouchard's book, High Performance Habits. And it's, although it's kind of a more sort of kind of, personal development skill I think it's a really good skill and I've tried it a couple of times is like typically if you're coming home from work and you kind of I can't remember how what it's called but basically what he says is 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 basically kind of bookending parts of your day so for instance when you're coming out of work zone and you're coming into home zone if you like you kind of take some time either like on the driveway if you've got a driveway just to sort of as you switch off the engine kind of just take 30 seconds a minute to kind of let go of your day and then get into the homes how do i want to show up when i get when i turn the keys in the door open up and that because when you're when you set foot in your front door your kids are like um you know they just think god has arrived at the front door and if you're in like you know if you've had a crappy day or you know someone's pissed you off or whatever and stuff you carry that energy home like it's and so um he uses he advocates this technique of kind of bookending different parts of your day so you kind of let go of one bit before you move on to the next bit so you show up at the next bit with that intention as to how you want to show up at the next bit um, and I think that's a really kind of powerful technique and it's a really easy thing that 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 dads can do and you could do it even if you're not kind of traveling home from work you could do it if you're if you know if your office is in the other part of the house or whatever you could do it before you open your office door have a little reminder or um something along those lines just to kind of break you know just to break those boundaries you know what i mean yeah i read a, an amazing book a long time ago i think it was the the name of the book i think was called the alter ego effect and i forget the author but he talked about um the door yeah. He said the door is the cue. So like you said, if you get out of the car or you're walking to your front door, as soon as you see a door, you have to have a quick check of like, who am I now turning up as? Mm. Am I the dad? Am I the businessman? Am I the inspirer? Am I the motivator? Am I the listener? And it might just be that you have this kind of word which then reframes how your emotion is. And I do that. I leave my, I've got a garden office, which I'm standing in now. When I leave that door um, and I go out into my garden, I just think I'm relaxed. Don't have to think about work. I've got like a hundred yard garden so I can walk through my garden and be like, I'm nice and relaxed, I'm calm. And then when I see my house, I'm like, right, I'm going in to see the girls. Like I'm, I'm hopefully walking into a nice fun environment. You know, we're gonna have some smiles or whatever. I just think it's a really nice uh, little thought process to think of because uh, so easy to get tripped up now like the lines are blurred between how we live our lives because so many of us are connected with technology mm-hmm. and i think that's one of my frustrations with how like how the mobile phone makes us behave like yeah. it's always there it's always in the pocket people can get hold of you work emails are pinging like, i don't have any notifications on my phone apart from whatsapp and text that's it mm-hmm. um so you know no instagram no email no nothing because I don't want to be disturbed like a, a, when I want to do my email, I'll do my email. Yeah. Like, I don't want it to get in the way of anything. And uh, I think these are all re- really little important habits for you to be immersive in whatever whatever is happening in your life. Yeah, yeah. And it's kind of it's. I did a post recently around the you know the greatest gift you can give your kids is a gift is presence, not presence. Um, mm. And I think the thing is, is I've been working with uh, my coach on this recently because. I think the thing is we get stuck into stuff and we get pulled into stuff and you know more and more now I'm sticking my phone on airplane mode or I'm just switching data and wi-fi off or 
in actual fact the other day I went out and I just left the phone at home my wife's got a phone if anyone needs to contact us you know they can do it in an emergency and stuff and just get, just begin to kind of break just break the chain of kind of check in and like you say notifications i think checking is the biggest habit for most people these days it's just checking to you know constantly checking have i got an email have i got a text have i got a whatsapp and, you know and i think that is the you know if you can get into the habit of kind of maybe having times of the day that you know twice a day or three times a day or whatever it's going to be for you where you are in control of it rather than it being in control of you because you know, it's like, it is crack cocaine for them. You know, the dopamine hits you get from technology now, they reckon are as to, uh, as potent as any of the class A drugs that you can get um, in terms of, you know, the the reward mechanisms they fire up in your brain. I haven't challenged any dads with this yet. I haven't spoke about it at all, but um, I suppose I'm fascinated by the topic of, this because like if I think about my phone I think about my daughter in my opinion there's not really anything on my phone that's more important than my daughter like Mm. she's number one my wife's number one so is it an active choice to say I'm going to look at my phone it's more interesting than my daughter or is it literally just a habit of like checking the phone checking the phone because at the there's got to be a point where a father a human a parent says I'm checking my phone. I'm in front of my child. This is more important than being with my child. And don't get me wrong. I'm not saying these are hard and fast rules. Like mobile phones connect us with people like your grandma's phone in, like all of that kind of stuff. I get it. But when it's becoming more than like, let's say 20% of our interaction with our kids, surely you've then got to question like why these things are getting in the way of your interaction with your kids. Mm. And then if it's because your kids are misbehaving and you know, they're frustrating and they're getting on your nerves and all the rest of it. Well, again, why is that? Like in my opinion, and from some of the stuff I've read, like if you're not engaging with your kids, then they will seek attention. Mm. They want that connection. They want that bond. And another great thing I learned from what you call the orange book is um, they always talk about, um, they call it like, bank banking time so she used this example where you might go down to the beach for a day out with your kids and a lot of dads parents whatever it's a little bit of a break for them and that's a totally normal thing like taking me paper down to the beach i've got my book or you know my ipad or whatever and you get and you sit down on the beach and you've got every intention of just sitting down and opening your book but your kids won't let you do that they want to play but then you get frustrated with your kids with not allowing you to play Really, she said, look, always bank time. So sit down and invest everything in the kids. And what you'll notice is within 10 minutes, they're playing by themselves and they don't even realize you're there. Mm. Like they're building a sandcastle, they're doing whatever, they're chasing crabs. And then you can just sort of sneak away and be like, cool, kids are happy. I'll read my book. And it's because I'm, I'm, I'm theorizing that a child wants to know you're there for play they want support they want security they want that connection and when they know they've got it their mind then wonders they go off and do things and i think that was a nice little lesson from that book about kind of like banking time Mm. so that they know that you're there and then you can kind of get on with some of the things that you would like to do as well yeah Um, yeah that's interesting i like that i like that concept and funny enough i had like an epiphany last year when we were on holiday because like up until last year was you know, my kids, uh, they were at an age where, you know, you, you'd want to be with them in the sea just to keep an eye on them and whatever and stuff and that. And um, it was really funny. So my wife sat down and she was like, right, dad, off you go. You're off with the kids now. So I'm like, so I, so I go into the water with the kids and stuff and that. And um, usually it would be kind of, you know, one would be with me and the other one would be off swimming and whatever and stuff and that. And for the first time, they're kind of like playing to get, they start to play together and stuff and whatever in, this, in the sea and whatever and that. And they're off. And so I'm like standing here, like waist tight and saying like, <laughs> right, so I'm surplus to requirements now, am I? So, uh, so <laughs> they just like disappear off. And so I was like, uh, so... I've never had this before because they've been toddlers, ba- babies, toddlers and whatever and stuff and that. So, you know, I just sort of laid down, you know, like you do and you just like look up at the sky sort of thing and whatever and just chilled out and just like acted like a kid myself for a bit and then went back to the shore and my wife said, so the kids are right. Don't, don't, shouldn't you be watching? I was like, no, I can, I can see them okay from here. They're, you know, they're fine or whatever. I was like, I 
feel a bit of surplus to requirements now. They don't need me anymore. They've just gone off by themselves. <laughs> and I was like, so I was a bit like all these years I've been like, why oh, it'd be really good when the kids can just go and occupy themselves. <laughs> and and now I'm like, actually, I feel quite sad now. They can occupy themselves and they don't need me sort of anymore. So it was a bit of a sad dad moment that was like. <laughs> Cats 22 right there. Yeah, wow. yeah exactly. Um, and I also just want to say for anyone listening, look, I don't have this all figured out. I'm working this stuff out. My daughter's 14 weeks old. So it's not like I know what happens when kids are three, five, seven, nine. I'm just, I'm just a guy who I think I'm quite self-aware. I've done quite a lot of work on myself. I coach and help people every day. Um, and that's why hopefully today I'll never speak in a black and white fashion. It's just things that I'm exploring, things that I'm questioning. And if anything, you know, dad listening to this, hopefully you're questioning it with me. Mm. Like I'm exploring this so you can explore it and we can just question our own behavior ourselves. Yeah, I like that because I think the thing is, is there is a point at which people, I think a lot of people feel that there is a point at which they've kind of arrived these days, if you know what I mean. So, well, you know, parenting can't be that difficult. I just do what my parents did. And it's kind of, it's a bit of a, a fool's kind of folly to get into that kind of mindset of thinking that way. And I'll, I'll never forget a um, a family friend. He, I think he had seven kids. I think some of them were adopted, some of them not. And wow. after, after I'd had my first, um, after we'd had our first, I remember sitting outside once before and he said, he said, um, he said, as a, as a parent, the strongest thing you have is instinct. Trust your instinct is very rarely wrong. Um, and he said, don't stress too much about, you know, learning too much information and stuff about the practicalities of it. A lot of it is kind of instinctual and trusting your instinct. And, you know, and a good example of this is um, when my youngest was really tiny. At the time, it was, oh, you don't need to give them water when it's really hot. You, they can just have milk and whatever and stuff. They don't need to have any water. And my mother-in-law said, oh, well, we used to just kind of boil water, let it cool down. So when it was really hot, they could have a bit of water as well as milk and that. And it never did them any harm. And so, and so you have this kind of, I think a lot of new parents go through this where they're like, oh, well, what should I do? Should I do it the way they're telling me now? Or should I do it? And, and in the end, we were just like, what's a bit of water really going to harm her sort of thing? So she had a little bit of cooled down, you know, sterilized water sort of thing. Um, and she was fine, but it's kind of, it's learning to trust your your instincts and your own, um, your gut instincts around these things, I think, is the is the strongest skill you can cultivate as a new parent rather than trying to second guess yourself, you know what I mean? Because sometimes people get like analysis by paralysis, I think, on on particularly new parents, I think. It's probably the problem we have now being a new parent is that you're in that conflict of you've got your parents on one side who are giving you advice of what they did. Then you've got grandparents as well. But then you've got the internet. And the internet is a big place with a lot of opinion, a lot of experts. And then you've got in the middle, like your NCT group that you join and like all that kind of stuff. And I was amazing when I heard the statistics of how many people actually do things like NCT and hypnobirthing is such a small percentage. Whereas in my circle of like friends, like it was completely the norm. Like everyone was like, yeah, yeah, NCT group. So it's definitely in just from what I've observed, I don't know the statistics. It generally seems like a bit more of a middle class thing, like an NCT group. Um, upper class, it's like, well, I'll just, you know, get a nanny or whatever. And then maybe like it just seemed like the lower, cl lower income cl class bracket, it wasn't that common. And um, we were talking to some of the midwives and they were like, oh, yeah, 95% yeah. of people that turn up for their baby have no idea what they're doing. Like they're in a panic, they're breathing, they're on their back. Like, and I just think how, so when you talk about intuition, when there's all these people out there that are just not even thinking about it, like it will just happen. Don't get me wrong. That's fine because loads of parents, loads of babies are fine. And most people grow up, but I suppose what we're now looking at and what your podcast is about is like, we don't want to be like 70% effective as a parent. Yeah. We're trying to be 80%, 90%. We want our kids to be really intelligent, really compassionate, really kind add to the world be lovely to be around like you want to be the parents where your um friends and family go oh your, your kids are lovely like they're so nice to be around like you know no one really wants like the troubled kid or whatever so while kids will be all right like they'll survive like they'll grow up okay what we're now asking ourselves is well, we want more than okay mm. yeah we want kids 
thrive. They, we want them to be awesome human beings. Yeah, and I like the way you say awesome human beings as well because it's kind of, I think the other tendency that often comes up is where people are trying to vicariously live out their youth through their kids. So they're like, oh, well, um, I must have little Johnny part, you know, doing the 11 plus because his friends are or doing. So it's kind of you get into this kind of keeping up with the Joneses. And I, I like the point that you make there about them being a, about them being a fulfilled, you know, um, nice human being to be around and stuff and that on a lot more kind of it's it's about them being a person rather than kind of a little robot that's passing exams all the time sort of thing. And I, and I think that there has been a tendency um, in the last, I don't know, a few decades. Uh, and I think it's always been the case to a certain extent where people are kind of, there is such a keeping up with the Joneses and like trying to, you know, trying to make your kid do all the stuff that you couldn't do and stuff and that. When in actual fact, they're different. They're, they're their own huge little, little person and they're going to develop their own interests and hobbies and stuff that they like and little mannerisms and stuff and that but i think there is um there is still this kind of element of parents that, that want to sort of impose what their view of what their kids should be onto their kids and you know i interviewed a lady called jess Leahy last year and she said to me she said the biggest thing that um kids tell me is um they just want their parents to know i'm not my brother i'm not my um uh, I'm not my mum, I'm not my dad, I'm me sort of thing. And I think it's keeping hold of that and developing that rather than actually, you're going to be like me or you're going to be like this person, you know what I mean? It's fascinating. I can't, I had a similar conversation. Um, I'm not sure where it was. I think it was on my podcast. We were talking about identity and how so young in a child's life we're trying to force upon them or make them think about what their identity should or could be. Mm. I think it might've actually been in the book and she was talking about, you know, how often when you're younger, do your grandparents go, so little Johnny, what do you want to be when you grow up? And little Johnny's like nine. And while that's a fun conversation, sometimes there's actually purpose behind it. They almost mm. want to influence their decision. Oh, like, oh, well, your dad was in the military or your dad went in the police and look at your dad. He's got medals and all the rest of it. And then they try and reinforce mm. that career path and that identity. And, and the lady in the book, she said, the problem with this is all you're doing is closing the mind of your child. Mm. All the child needs to be able to do as they grow is just allow their mind to grow in every direction, explore everything, try everything, be exposed to everything. But as soon as the parent starts to say, oh, that's not a very good job, and that's not a very good character trait, and that person's not very nice, that child then does just become a version of the parent because mm. we've subliminally over time just influenced their identity because we generally think that our identity is the best. Why wouldn't you? Mm. It's only natural. Like you will think you are the best human in the world. And that's why I think the journey of self-development before you become a parent is a great way to obviously go about it. Not everyone has that luxury. Like I get it. Um, but like as soon as you have that epiphany as a parent, I think you've got to go on that journey because you will start to build that impression into your child mm. very, very, very quickly. And one of the things I'm aware of at the moment is um, me and my wife are quite quite fun, quite relaxed, quite open-minded characters. And we tease each other a bit, like me and the wife, like we take, take the piss, like, you know, we and family take the piss. And um, I kind of wonder how that resonates with someone who doesn't understand what that is. Yeah. So like, even with my child now, Ivy, I'm like, oh, are you being silly? Are you smart? Are you being funny? Are you smelly? Like all these words, like at what point do they catch on to what silly means and smelly and, what like what does that what impressions does that leave on them i don't have the answer i'm just running through all this stuff at the moment and at the moment it's probably okay because she has no idea what i'm saying it's literally just words it's tone um and hopefully she sees it as positive because i'm being positive i'm smiling but then if someone uses that terminology and they're not smiling then what do they associate with that word and stuff um Anyway, yeah. oh man, there's a lot of rabbit holes here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's and it comes back to yeah, and it, and and again, I discussed this in my last episode. It is it's it's how they begin to kind of make meaning of you know the meaning of words and the meaning of social interactions and stuff. And I think that you know one one of the things that 
kind of is a kind of little bit of from the left field on this with kind of face masks at the minute you know so much of what we do mm. is through facial interaction you know so you imagine like half of my face you can't see this if you're listening but you will do on the youtube video half of my face has been covered it completely changes the conversation that we're having because all you can see is my eyes if i do that then you can see the you know you can see the smile you can see the way my lips are moving you know and i think that we had a really interesting uh i, I interest I, I noticed something when i went shopping the other day in that a lot of the shops where the staff had face masks on you could just see the eyes and it was it's kind of slightly 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 um intimidating and you didn't kind of you, you didn't know what they what their mood was and you couldn't kind of get a gauge of it and then we walked into one shop to get my wife's um, watch strap adjusted and the, the girl in there she had a face mask on but she was very charismatic so a lot of hand movements you know um, she was kind of quite bubbly so she was kind of bouncing around sort of thing and stuff and that kind of body language and stuff it kind of counter it counteracted the fact that you couldn't see half of her face and it kind of made up for it but whereas if you're someone that's kind of not really sort of you know not very expressive with your hands and not kind of quite bubbly having that thing covering half your face you know, and it, it it kind of it feeds into this discussion on making meaning of facial expressions and interactions and stuff and that. So this is all stuff that people are going to have to kind of navigate in the next kind of little while as we come off lockdown and the new normal as it is, so to speak. Mm. I think what you've just said there about the intention of a word or a phrase is actually very important because... You know, I, I'm always fascinated by some of the words around food because obviously I'm a nutritionist. So I'm fascinated about the, the, the dynamics of food in the home and how you bring up kids to uh, understand food. And there can be a lot of negative terminology in a home. Treat can be one of those words like, shall we have a treat? And I think even the way that you say it, how you introduce a treat into the home, your relationship with a treat could make or break and loads of people in the fitness industry have sort of poo pooed on words like treat. But I'm like, well, actually like I have quite a positive relationship with the word treat actually, because in my home, a treat was maybe we'd go down the beach one day and we'd have an ice cream, we'd have an ice cream as a treat. And it was said in a positive way. We look forward to it as exciting. And then we had a, a pudding as a treat on a Sunday mm -hmm. with Sunday lunch. And that was it. They were the only treats in the home. That was very normal. It's how I was brought up. But whereas now, because we have so much food availability, we have a lot more affluence generally. People are able to afford like very sugary things. Like, you know, we're going shopping regularly. They're at petrol stations. They're everywhere. A treat is now something that's all the time. Mm. And it's because we have a bit of a disordered relationship potentially with treat-based foods, well, we've now made that a negative thing in terms of the behavior long term around food with the child potentially mm. so I, I i am fascinated by the intention behind words which is kind of what you've made me realize just having this narrative with myself at the moment um because you know so many of the things we do could be negative or positive but it's how we go about them mm. how we communicate them the actual meaning behind what we do yeah yeah it's interesting it's a it's, it's a discussion where you could just go like you could just go on for like hours and hours and hours talking about yeah like, the meaning behind I want, it i want people to know there's no perfect answer like honestly i'm not trying to force an impression i'm just having a really nice open dialogue with you to say look this is kind of what i think this is kind of what i'm ex exploring this is you know and, and you take from it what you want like there's nothing worse as you know than people being overly overt or impressionable with their opinion of you as a parent like you because you just want to say fuck off <laughs> in all <laughs> frankness so i just want to reassure people that i'm not trying to be um you know overtly opinionated or my way is the right way um, i'm still working all of this stuff out myself <laughs> and don't and trust me you will never work it all out like it's a, yeah. it is part of the journey it is part of the it is it is, it is going to be a long sort of journey and just in it and just when you think you kind of kind of figured it out a bit and one of the things that i find quite funny it's funny because it just just underlines how stupid parents can be at some at some stage is when you as they go through the kind of age brackets and in your mind's eye you're like hang on a minute um we do this with bedtime so like bedtime you'll sort of think oh well 
um, why is my eight year old not going to bed at seven? And then you suddenly think, wait a minute, she's not like four, she's not like five or six anymore. She's eight. And then hang on a minute, that's why she's not going, to, she's getting older. So, and you just like, and her life has sort of not passed you by, but you, you, you just, you get, you get stuck in a set of circumstances as to how you're, uh, you know, approaching bedtime. And then you realize actually this is a, this is an ever evolving thing that you've got to adjust to and then, and then tweak your, tweak it as it's going on sort of thing. And it's, it's to, there's already always these little things that kind of trip you up where you sort of think, actually, um, why isn't she, why isn't, they, why isn't she doing this anymore? And you're like, uh, actually she's not four anymore. And you kind of like, <laughs> you, but it, it just goes past in such a whiz that you just don't, you just don't see it. And, you, and you're like, oh, that's, that, that's why. And you're like, like that. So like, why did I not think about that? You know what I mean? So. Um, I like the way you touched upon nutrition, and I, and one of the things that I really like about you, Ben, is that um, your social media posts and what you say about nutrition, you're very kind of candid and very frank about what your kind of thoughts are and what is total and utter BS around nutrition and what isn't. And my kind of journey, if you like, into nutrition came. My dad passed away in 2015, and so I went and had a like a because I've got a family of a history of heart disease in my family through parents and grandparents and stuff and that so I went to the doctor got checked out and the doctor said mm, your cholesterol is a little bit on the high side just go and look at your diet and I didn't really think anything more of it and us and so so you start googling as most people do and um, then I sort of got into sort of looking at you know in the relationship of inflammation and all this kind of stuff I, and I ended up reading a book called the primal blueprint by Mark Sissons and that was kind of my sort of first step into really thinking any more about nutrition than, than than the average person and so I did that for a bit and it was okay it's a variation on kind of primal so it's quite restrictive um, and I did it for a period of time and I sort of kind of came off it but the bottom line is is I paying a bit more attention to it I think was a good thing because it, you begin to get kind of curious and look into different things and stuff and I've gradually put sort of carbs back in a bit more and stuff. And um, I did have good, you know, I, I had good results on it. But the thing was, is I was let, eating less processed food, a lot more vegetables, and there is kind of common denominators in it. And I just wonder what your kind of thoughts are on where we're at in terms of kind of fad diets and the basics of kind of sort of healthy eating and stuff and that. Because everyone has their own reasons. Mine was probably longevity, stroke not wanting chronic chronic disease to carry on and you know what i mean so generally i think we overcomplicate nutrition and also the industry overcomplicates nutrition there's a lot of people out there with a lot of opinions a lot of hypotheses a lot of different diet books and that does make it confusing because everyone is almost presenting themselves as an expert, mm -hmm. you know, to the average guy and girl, even a blogger who's speaking with authority might feel like they're an expert and really they're not. So we need to know where is credible information, like what is actually scientifically proven like time and time again. Um, you know, there's websites that I constantly reference to people like examine.com for example so mm -hmm. if you wanted to look at something like uh, cholesterol you could go to examine.com completely impartial it brings together all the research in the scientific world around nutrition and supplementation and it writes unbiased like this is what would happen if your cholesterol was high like blah, blah, blah. so knowing those sources of information is really important if you're ever in trouble with nutrition like just strip it right back to basics. Like just ask yourself, what do I think humans are designed to eat? Well, probably fairly natural food. So what is natural food? Fruits, vegetables, lean meats, potatoes, you know, oats, all that kind of stuff. Should I maybe consume alcohol that often? Probably not. Like you should probably have some in your diet, that's fine. But you know, don't have too much. Mm -hmm. Like processed food, do I think I should have it too much? Well, probably not. Mm -hmm. If I have it now and again, will it become a problem? Nah, probably not. Should I get a takeaway three nights a week? Mm, might be hard to stick to my weight if I have a takeaway three times a week because takeaways are generally very calorific. Mm. So I might just have a takeaway like once a week at the weekend. And once you start actually asking these questions of yourself, just being very critical, very open, can make it a lot easier. Yeah. Like, then we know that 
calories are king when it comes to fat loss. Like if you're overweight, you eat too much. So what's a simple way that we could maybe reduce what you're eating? And it might be something really simple, like you've got into a bit of a habit that in your work van, you have a packet of biscuits sitting there. And every time you have a cup of tea, you always grab a couple of biscuits. It's probably not a great habit to maintain healthy weight. So maybe it might just be as simple as don't buy the biscuits. Habits might go a lot deeper than that. But sometimes it's just a case of really just standing back, opening up your kind of, you know, nutrition eyes, look at all of your habits, dissect them. And then nutrition is actually really simple. Like, mm. you know, as a parent, you don't have to get overly complicated. Like great nutritious meals are things like spaghetti bolognese, shepherd's pies, like, you know, like stews and stuff. Like none of it's complicated. Mm. All the classics still work. It's just, maybe some treats are in the house too much. Maybe we're a little bit lazy with some of the food preps. So we're kind of like, well, you know, I'll just microwave this and I'll just do that. And I'll try and tie the kids over by giving them a couple of biscuits so they don't argue while I'm cooking dinner. And then that comes down to organization. Yeah. I had a chat with an amazing human the other day. She was a mum, like busy, full-time job, two kids. And she was like really struggling with nutrition like uh, we're all over the place, like we eat badly. And I was like, do you sit down once a week and make a food shopping list with your kids and involve the kids? Like, what do you want this week? What shall I cook? Blah, blah, blah. And she's like, no, no, I just literally run into the shops every couple of days and grab some stuff. And I'm like, I'd be honest, I think your nutrition, nutrition with your kids and yourself would vastly improve if you just planned what you were going to eat. Mm. And on our fridge door, we have Monday, what we're having for dinner, Tuesday, what we're having for dinner. We write it together. We do the food order. Then we write a load of lunches that we're going to get. We don't fix the lunches because you kind of, if you're working from home, you kind of want to eat uh, with a bit more flexibility. And sometimes just planning it yeah. is half the battle. Right? And getting out of those habits where you've let all the planning slip. Mm -hmm. now, you know, things, and, and it always happens when things get busy or you go on holiday, you come back from holiday and everything's just a bit manic. You go to the MS on the way home from the airport and just grab enough for like 24 hours. And I'm just gonna get and my just gonna get my coat at this point, and then <laughs> <laughs> And then you're like, right, what's in the freezer? We'll defrost that. And then you're kind of on the back foot again. And I just think so much of effective parenting, health, fitness mindset is just taking that hour every week where you reset, you reset your diary. You get the food shop organized, you get the kids' diary organized. Like if you've got all of that stuff nailed and then you've given responsibility, I'll do this, you do that, like whatever, um, then it just like it can be so seamless. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the thing is, is it, it it becomes people think of it as a difficult thing to do. Like my wife as she does that, she has like a list of stuff on the, you know, a whiteboard in the kitchen and like is mega, mega organized on what we're eating when we're eating it and stuff and that and yeah it's it's interesting how uh just doing sort of simple things can actually kind of yield some really kind of good results and i remember watching a program before where there was a child i think it was an autistic child actually and they changed her diet kind of radically um and they were like you know she's not going to eat she's not going to eat peppers chopped up in a bowl she's just not she, she. and after a while they kept putting it in front of her and kind of like and, and you know, not have any biscuits in the house. And she kind of took one, hmm, took another one. And then all of a sudden it kind of evolves where to where she's actually saying, can I have a pot, can I have a pot of peppers chopped up and stuff and that. And so the taste buds began to kind of change and getting used to different foods and different textures and stuff and that. And it becomes a lot more kind of uh, second nature, you know what I mean? Mm, I've had already some fascinating uh, conversations around nutrition with parents because uh, like we talked about earlier, a lot of, you know, a lot of our parenting is what we believe to be right. So as a parent, and let's just say a parent is age 35, their nutritional beliefs will be really how they eat. It's an expression of their beliefs, how they eat right now. So I was having a chat with um, a guy the other day and he said, well, you know, I, I give my kids quite a few like, treats crisps you know all that kind of stuff because well kids like that stuff don't they and i was like okay interesting where did they learn to like it oh well you know well well i like it and so i started buying it and it was in the cupboards and i was like 
So they like it because you like it because you gave it to them. Oh yeah, I suppose so. But you know, that's just what kids eat, isn't it? I was like, well, do they just eat that? Mm. You're in control of that. Like for the first six year, uh, six months of my child's life, she'll only have one food, milk. And until I introduce something, she won't know what food is. Like she's completely impressionable. I have full control over what she is able to eat, what she's exposed to. So actually a child picks up everything food wise in the early days from their parents because mm -hmm. they control it in the environment. Now don't get me wrong when they get a bit older and they start to see grandparents go to a kid's party, all of that kind of stuff changes. So I'm really aware now as a parent and I'm t having quite a lot of conversations of like what happens before that happens? Mm. Like what foundation do you set up? Like if you're going out for a day out with your kids and you just grab some Farley's Rust or you just grab something, what are you? what is your view of nutrition then? What mm. impression are you then giving to your child that nutrition is just something that you grab? Oh, we're busy, so we just eat our packets. Mm. Yeah. And is, that, is that good enough? Like you're yeah. able to decide on what that opinion is. I'm not saying I'm right or wrong, but if we think nutrition is important in the health of the human body, we have to plan that. Mm. You can't leave that stuff to chance, in yeah. my opinion. Yeah. And it's interesting because I think the thing is that I, you know, I grew up in the sort of like 80s, 90s. You're, I think, a little bit younger than me, but you still had this kind of, you know, kids were given like a you know the Farley's Rusk or you know they were given you know you still had this idea around kind of what kids are eating and one of the interesting I was speaking to a functional health practitioner last year about this very fact and it, it didn't occur to me till I was talking to her about the fact that cowpole is administered you know you get a you get the paracetamol hit but it's administered in a nice little sugar hit as well so straight away from kind of and and I and she was like, yeah, I've never really, I've never really thought about that either. And so straight away, your their brain association is pain, pain relief, sweetness. And so, what does that do to the hard wiring of a kid's brain? Where from kind of day one, I'm not saying sugars, but again, comes. I'm not saying sugars bad and stuff, but it's just interesting that we've all got into this over the years of right. If a kid's ill, we're going to give them cowpole, but it's a hit essentially. It's it's paracetamol wrapped up in this nice sugary syrup, which gives them a big old, and you can get sugar, sugar-free cowpole, but you're still getting that sweet taste associated with being poorly. And do you know what I mean? It's kind of like, mm. it's trigger. It's hit again. It's hitting a little reward mechanism for poorliness. And I don't know, maybe I'm overanalyzing it, but to me, that seems kind of a bit counter intuitive to what we're trying to do here. You know what I mean? Yeah, I suppose we know that from a young age, a sweet taste is quite a palatable taste. It's one that a child knows. Um, so like breast milk, is, you know, it's got a slightly sweet taste to it. It's not overtly sweet, but it's slightly sweet. It's kind of kind of similar to cow's milk, really, but I wouldn't say it's quite as strong as cow's milk. Um, so right from an early age, they kind of know that. But then as they get older and we give them foods that have been manufactured by companies, that sweet taste gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And if you actually look at how a lot of children eat, sweetness is one of the only centers of the tongue in terms of taste that is stimulated all day. So if we look at sweet cereal, um, potentially a sandwich can be sweet for some people. I don't, you know, I don't know what people are putting in lunch boxes. Sometimes dinners can be sweet. Like, you know, there's, there's quite a lot happening in there, especially when you look at snacks, mm. quite a lot of snacks can be sweet. And then we've got salty, but then what about bitter? A lot of kids don't like bitter foods, but then when were they exposed to it? A lot of kids don't like oily fish. Mm. And when they were ex when are they exposed to it? So, um, yeah, I think it's fascinating. Um, and every single parent I've worked with that's weaned a child from a young, early age and is stuck with like, look, just give them all sorts of stuff, like make it a buffet, have bits of oily fish, have avocado, have strawberries, have literally everything and just let them play, let them taste it. They might not like fish one day, but in 20 days, they might like it. And you mm. do have to have repeated exposure. And I think that's one of the things about working on yourself first is you realize how long it can take you to pick up things and start to make habits that you previously disliked into something that you like. Mm. And if a child doesn't like something two or three times, is that really enough? Yeah. Like for them to pick up 
the fact that they might like it if they just try it quite a few times. So I, I do think you have to have quite a lot of skin in the game yeah. in terms of food in the household. But I'll reserve my judgment because I was only 14 weeks and she's still on the boob. So. <laughs> <laughs> One of the funny things, my uh, my oldest daughter had a birthday uh, last week and she doesn't, she's, my youngest is like really into sweet stuff, like, yeah, real sweet tooth. My oldest, she's kind of like savoury and we're like, so, so what birthday cake do you want? I want a stuffing cake. So we made this layered like <laughs> stuffing cake. So it was like, so I'll have to send you a picture of this. And so it's basically done in sandwich things. It was two layers of stuffing cake. Um, and then she'd put a Yorkshire pudding in the middle at the top. This is weird. This is going to be weird. Mint sauce, mint sauce with turkey, like really weird flavour combinations. And then and then we put pork scratchings around the side and then topped it off with like streaky bacon. It was the most bizarre cake. And so, so she's like, so, so, so she says, so we're sitting down, the grandparents come around. I was like, oh, so, um, so who wants a slice of the, uh, who wants a slice of the stuffing cake? And everyone's like, oh, so we, we had the like sponge cake sort of thing. And then, so Isla has this slice of sponge cake and um, a, a, spun, a slice of uh, stuffing cake. And then we were like, well, granddad, why don't you give granddad some to take away with him? So poor old granddad takes this slice of like stuffing cake. So I don't, I don't know whether he ate it or not. But yeah, it was a it was a sight to behold this stuffing cake. It was the first, my first, first trial of making one. <laughs> I am all for that. I'm a savoury man. Like buy me a scotch egg over a cake any day. I love it. Yeah. I'm going to send you this picture of this stuffing cake. In fact, I might have to put it on these show notes for this. Actually, the, 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 uh, the stuffing cake uh, escapade. Um, but as a nutritionist, I just want to make sure, you know, for everyone listening, that I am not a food Nazi in any way, shape or food. I think food's a massive part of the home and family environment. It's where a lot of connection and conversation is made. And, you know, birthday should be celebrated with a cake or like fun things. It's just how prevalent that then starts to become in the home, how culturally we start to say this is when we have biscuits and sweets and cakes. And for a lot of people, it's a massive part of a child's food intake. And then mm. when we're potentially questioning health and development, strength, you know, uh, when kids have got eczema, allergies, all this kind of stuff. And then we, we when we look at the diet, it's like, well, really like 40% of what a child's eating is, you know, maybe classed as good stuff. Mm. So I don't want anyone to think that I'm some food Nazi, but I do believe that there has to be a strong balance in flavor, favor of real food. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And I think that is one point, you know, cycl- circling back to the one thing that a number of different diets have in common is this emphasis on real food. Most of them, that is a kind of common, common denominator, real food, more veggies. And people sort of think, oh yeah, I'm a really good, good results on this mainly because they're probably drinking a lot more water they're shopping on the edges of the supermarket a lot more and they're just giving a little bit more thought as to a what they're eating and b how much of it they're eating and that awareness i think makes changes a lot easier anyway but i think there was there was one thing that i that i liked um during lockdown that you you made a post i remember um because I commented on it and you were talking about the fact that people needed to kind of keep an eye on their diet during lockdown and I remember that there was a number of people that were kind of really sort of how could you say such a thing we're going through the most stressful period of our lives and whatever and stuff and that and my kind of comment to you was um, I agree with what you're saying because we're going through a period where we know that this virus is affecting people with its pre-existing conditions people that um, are kind of over maybe overweight um, and if there's any point in history where you want to be watching what you're eating, it's going to be kind of, it's going to be now. And following on from that, Ben, I just wanted to unpackage with you what your thoughts are around, you know, we don't know what's going to happen in the next little while in terms of coming into the winter and stuff and that. But, you know, at the back of my mind and maybe at the back of other people's mind is how do we hit this next Q3, uh, autumn, Q4, winter period in our best shape in terms of not just fitness but also kind of our you know boosting our immune systems and stuff i think there's been a like a there's been an element i think you know with i call it the kind of joe wicks element not no disrespect to joe wicks but i think that when lockdown first happened 
it was kind of like New Year's Day where everyone makes these New Year's resolutions and they just hit the gyms and go crazy. But there's not a very strong why behind what they're doing. So what happens is the gym car parks are empty by March 1st. And I'm seeing a little element of that with lockdown where people have gone crazy and a lot of people are kind of like, actually, now I'm kind of in the dip. And, you know, what do we do going into the back end of this year to get ourselves hitting the winter in A1 shape is my question. <laughs> I would say it's what we all know we should be doing. Yeah. Like there's no magic answer. The problem is, is people have had sort of their motivation knocked, their inspiration knocked, like, and don't get me wrong, some people have been through it, like, in a rough way, like, mm. you know, homeschooling kids, working from home, trying to keep a busy job, like, all of that stuff um, puts a lot of stress. But as soon as you know that you are in control, that you can make a plan and you can make progress, all I would say is say, right, tomorrow, I'm just going to turn a new leaf of the book. Let's not live in the wake of lockdown. Let's not think I should have done this and, you know, whatever. Just sit down and say, right, tomorrow's Monday and this is how I want to turn up to Monday. I'm going to go for a brisk walk in the morning. I'm going to prepare my breakfast. I'm going to get my lunch sorted. I'm going to plan my time with the kids. Like whatever, like you are in control of the day. Mm -hmm. You are in control of what you eat. You might not be able to go to the gym. You might not want to go to the gym, but you could probably be active somewhere in your day, whether it's going for a brisk walk, playing with your kids in the garden, playing football or tennis or whatever. So I think, you know, quite often people get really bogged down with what's happened in the past and they'll come to a coach. People will speak to me and they're like, Ben, I need some motivation. And I'm like, why is that? Oh, well, this happens and that's happened. I was like, forget that. How do you want to turn up to tomorrow? Mm. Oh, well, there's your plan. Go write it down. Go commit to it. Go do it. Mm. Yeah. So keep it simple and stay and consistency being the name of the game. So rather than, I guess, go off and try and do stupid stuff that you can't do, build up slowly, get consistent, get the easy wins under your belt. You know, even if it's a case of work, walking 30, 45 minutes a day to begin with every day, just say 30 days, that's going to be my goal for the next 30 days. Right, I've done that. You know, what could be my next goal? Would I, you know, do I, do I do go a little bit further? Do I turn it into a jog or, you know, do I stick a weighted vest on or whatever, but just keep things moving forward and stay build those hat you know we talked about we talked about um habits earlier on in the conversation and you know those morning habits morning routines winning the day definitely um most people when they want to diet or they want to change they'll flip open some book that they've got you know whether it's joe wicks or whatever then right right tomorrow i'm starting this <laughs> plan and the problem is that plan is go to the gym four days a week, eat this, do that. And it's extreme. It's always extreme because it's like an idealistic plan. Mm. So, um, you know, sometimes I'll ask the question to my clients, what could you do tomorrow that would take you one step closer to your goal? And the great thing about changing a habit is it usually leads to other positive habit changes. Mm. So uh, one thing I like to talk about is breakfast because actually Quite often, if you get breakfast right, it then makes you think about lunch because you've engaged in the habit. So I might say to someone, what do you do for breakfast? Oh, I usually don't have time, you know, quite often snooze through my alarm, like running out the door with a bit of toast in my mouth kind of scenario. I'm like, well, what would happen if you set your alarm and committed to the fact that you wanted to get up and make yourself a proper breakfast? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I could do that. Actually, I want to do that. And actually, by default, while they're making breakfast, they prepare lunch. And because they're preparing lunch, they probably fill up a two litre bottle of water. And then all of a sudden, just these other habits start to slip in just by committing to doing the first habit properly. Mm. Yeah, that's what um, James Clear calls that habit stacking. I think it's called yes. the term he uses. Um, but yeah, I, I know what you mean. Because like, funny enough, I can relate to that. Because when I, and this is going back to the new parenting, I used to skip breakfast and then when my kids, when my first was like really young, I was feeling wasted all the time because I was going effectively fasted through to dinner what, on the previous day through till lunch the next day. But obviously being a new parent takes a massive amount out of you mentally, like you've just like you just said today. And so I was like, I've always kind of skipped breakfast and stuff. I'm gonna eat breakfast. And I felt 10 times better just for eating breakfast. And there's a, 
you know, a lot of, I remember talking to Dan Fallon about this recently and, you know, on the subject of intermittent fasting. And he made the point that, you know, it's not for everyone. And particularly with busy parents, if you're rushing around doing stuff and that, you, you might need, you know, it, what might be good for one person is not always good for you. So you might need to ha- make sure you do have a good, like a good breakfast every day to get something in your fuel tank. Uh, mm. Other people might not, you know, might not have the demands that they need to do that first thing, but it's finding out kind of what works for you, isn't it, sort of thing. Yeah, I've just seen I need to go in five minutes. I uh, need to be out the door soon to a cricket match. Uh, Don't want to miss my meditation, eh? Um, (laughs) So with things like intermittent fasting, we've got to remember it's a stress on the body and being a new parent is a stress. Mm. So I always say to people, look, if you're not in a good place, don't do something nutritionally or training wise that is stressful. It's like being a new dad and committing to running a marathon. It's probably a pretty bad move. That's going to be a lot of added stress, mm. both physically and mentally. So, you know, when I became a dad, I just like, I cleared the diary, no commitments. I was like, look, for the first three months, I'm just being a dad, like that's it. And then when I'm ready, I'll re-engage with that stuff. Mm. Um, and you know, ignore what people are doing around you, ignore what people are saying, like you do you. And, you know, and that's probably sometimes the problem with technology and social media is like everyone always like there's always someone else is putting in more effort than you or doing more, eating better or whatever. Like there's always those comparisons to make. But as long as you're trying to do the best by yourself, your family and your situation, and you can genuinely stand there and say, I am doing the best given my circumstances, then you're doing your best and be kind Mm. to yourself for that. Yeah, I love it. I love it. We've had a wicked conversation today and we've gone through a, t- a ton of stuff. So I'm going to link it for anyone that's um, watching or listening to this. What I'll do is I'll link all this up in the show notes and I'll put the links in so you don't have to, if you're driving along in the car listening to this, you don't have to jot it all down and stuff and that. Um, I'm going to ask you a question, Ben, which I don't prime any of the guests for that I come onto the podcast. What is the thing in life that gives you meaning? What gives me meaning? Knowing that the life that I live, I'm going all in. Mm -hmm. So like when I think about death, when I think about my career, when I think about being a father, a husband, don't want to leave anything on the table. Don't want to say, should have traveled more. Don't want to say, should have loved my wife more. Don't want to say, oh, I can't believe I taught Ivy that and now she's, you know, whatever. You know, don't want to leave anything on the table. So that's what fires me up every day. And that's why I talk about this thing of living an awesome life. It's not about getting it perfect. It's not about getting it right. It's just about committing to yourself to go all in and do it as best as you can. And that's when people ask me, like, what advice would you give to your younger self? What would you have done differently knowing what you know now? And I'm like, that's a really like debilitating conversation because in hindsight, you're always going to have reflections of like, should have done that. That's just maturity. That's just knowledge. Mm. But the thing that I appreciate from my young journey, like literally from the age of about 18 and a half, is I just made the decision to go all in on my life. Mm. Like, I'm going to do the best. I'm going to try the hardest in my career. I'm going to try the hardest at sport. Like, I'm just going to go all in. And um, I think that's all you can ask for yourself. I love it. It's really good. I do like. I do like that. It's a really good one. I ask that question <laughs> to every single one of my guests, and the 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 response is always different. If people want to find out about you and the work that you're doing, sir, what is the best way for them to do so? Reach out to you um, and get involved with the uh, Ben Cooper story. Yeah. Uh, I have a podcast, assuming you like podcasts because you're listening to a podcast. Uh, Feel free to come and have a look over at Ben Coomer Radio. Uh, I've got a show that comes out twice weekly, one long, one short. And if you want to know about nutrition, you're welcome to go to btn.academy, which is uh, my nutrition education company. There's a free nutrition course on the homepage if you want to kind of just, you know, learn a bit. And it's, it's all via video. So you can just, you know, watch and, you know, you don't have to use too much brain power. Um, and then, uh, yeah, that's kind of it. Just Google my name, have a look. If anything's of interest, awesome. If it's not, all good. Excellent. 
Thank you very much for coming on and speaking to me today, uh, Ben. It's been a really interesting conversation and I like the fact that we've been able to kind of get under the skin of a few different um, topics and unpack it in a really cool way. So thank you very much. And I better leave you to get on to your uh, cricket match. Yeah, don't want to uh, don't want to disappoint the boys. But I'm going to get my fancy dress on. <laughs> oh, exactly, exactly. It's trying to get dads out there at the minute. It's because everyone's become a recluse. It's like you coming out, you coming out. No, oh, I'm going to start home. Yeah. Come on, come out, just come out. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait. Uh, have a couple of beers and play a bit of cricket. Excellent. Mine, there you go, man. Thank you, sir. Cheerio. Take care. Goodbye.